librarian. Forget that she was a writer of children's books. She was an educator. She was born with that. Conocí a Doña Pura del Pre de White en la ciudad de Nueva York a comienzos de la década del 70 o finales de los 60, ya no recuerdo. Pero fue con motivo de la posibilidad de yo diseñar e ilustrar un nuevo libro de ella, The Rainbow Colored Horse, el caballito color de arco iris. The fact that she was a pioneer as a librarian, a pioneer as a, a folklorist for Puerto Rican folklore, um, a pioneer with dramatizing her stories using puppets. Um, I forgot to mention it with the South Bronx Project. She created a mobile traveling puppet theater uh, and she engaged the children. She wrote the scripts. She acted as a director with the children. The children learned the scripts. They did the, the shows. Uh, she showed the children how to make the puppets. Um, so in that sense, she was a pioneer. Her willingness to publish these stories, which were until then uh, in existence. Flora uh, was very, very kind. And I would meet her at um, sometimes at the American Library Association conferences, because, you know, our conferences uh, in that uh, American Library Association are all over the country. And we, they usually meet twice a year. And so from time to time, I would meet for her. Sometimes she would stay at the same hotel and uh, we'd go down for breakfast or whatever it was and we would chat. She would walk into a room and she would command that room and that audience. At the children's theater, both children and adults um, were mesmerized by her performance. Um, she had a presence that was outstanding and unique. Definitely. Her vision was that a child learns a lot about himself and the world around him by reading books. And like the other librarians that she collaborated with uh, during the 20s, 30s, and 40s, they believed it was really important to create communities of readers starting as young as possible. And that that you know, leads to a more fulfilling life. Uh, they, they were, I call them in uh, one essay, the storybook Jesuits. They were almost evangelical about their desire to promote literacy and uh, in their efforts to recruit the kids to come into the library. They did story hours, they had puppetry clubs, and they had all sorts of uh, raffles and, and uh, card drives. Um, she really had a passion for what she did, and she was extremely successful at it as well. I used to go to the library. My sister Lillian used to take me to the Aguilar Library because we lived in in El Barrio. And Perez and Martina was my, one of my favorite books. I used to love to take that book out. Many years ago, in a little house with a round balcony, there once lived a Spanish cockroach called Martina. She was a pretty cockroach with black eyes and soft brown skin. She was very refined and exceedingly proud of her descent. Martina was a splendid housekeeper, so that her pots and pans were always bright and shiny. One day, as she was sweeping her patio, she found an old rusty coin. She picked it up and polished it and polished it until it was as bright as the sun. Why, said Martina, it is a peseta. What shall I buy with it? She thought and thought what to buy with her money, but she could not think of anything to suit her taste. First story that I heard from my, my grandmother's lips was uh, La Cucaracha Martina y los Atoncito Perez. That's it. And I, I always say that Perez and Martina has been my golden key in opening doors for me everywhere. 1898, obviously, is a super, super significant uh, year in the history of uh, the colony of Puerto Rico. Um, it's the Spanish-American War, and she was actually born uh, within days of the ratification of the Treaty of Paris. 
right? which was ratified by the us congress by one vote margin um, that was also the year when there was a, a huge hurricane 1899 san siriaco uh, which was uh, the worst hurricane atlantic hurricane on record uh, it lasted something like 28 days. It was a tropical storm afterwards. Uh, it devastated the crops. You know, hundreds of people were killed. Um, and in the wake of the U.S. invasion and occupation of Puerto Rico, um, you know, people who are already generally, most people weren't, you know, they had very little. But uh, because of the political upheaval, um, they had even less. Right? and because of the hurricane. So times were really hard for most Puerto Ricans uh, at the turn of the 20th century. So she bought her box of powder, and that day she powdered her little face as she had not done for a long time. Then she put on her best dress, took a little fan, and sat on her chair again. I wonder, said Martina as she sat there, if Perez the mouse will come to visit me today. Now, Perez was a gallant little mouse who lived in the same town as Martina. There was no one who could bow just as Perez could. No one danced or talked as he did. And many a one wondered if Perez had not come from royal descent. We know from her signal record that her father, her father's name was uh, Felipe Beltre, and he was born in Guayama, a very interesting city with a very interesting history. Um, and his, her mother uh, was Carlota Nogueras, and she was born in Calle. But we, you know, she ended up going to Central High School in San Juan in, and graduated from there in 1919. So the family at some point moved to the capital. Education was really um, difficult to attain for Puerto Ricans at that time. So it's remarkable that she managed to get a high school education. UPR wasn't opened until, what, 1903? And the Department of Education, and she's born in the wake of the Spanish-American War, right, in 1899. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education had critically underfunded the schools there. So it was very difficult for kids to be able to even afford to go to school. Uh, so I wonder, you know, the family must have had some relative affluence at that point in time. But again, I don't know how or why she, she managed to get into uh, both, you know, the, the prestigious high school and then into the UPR. After a while, she had another visitor. This time, a proud old cop who had always admired her. Buenos dias, señorita Martina, says señor cop. Buenos dias, señor cop, said Martina. Pretty Martina, will you marry me? Or perhaps, said Martina, if you tell me how you would talk to me in the future. Yes, says señor cop, standing straight, flapping his wings and saying, said Martina, rising from her chair. No, Senor Cop, I will not marry you. Do you think I can stand such a noise in my house forever? <laughs> Senor Cop bowed low, and like Senor Cap departed, with eyes filled with tears, and feeling his little heart almost torn to pieces. Oh, I came because, um, of the um, wedding of a sister who had taught um, in Puerto Rico for 20 years and uh, who had visited the United States and um, met uh, a young man who later um, asked our brother-in-law with whom we live in, in San Juan, Puerto Rico, for her hand. And so uh, at the end of the school year, she was to come to New York and marry him. And my sister decided that she wanted her sisters and brother at the wedding. So that's why we all came. Puna tells the story um, that she may 
have had a vague interest. She went to visit the library when she first came to New York. She didn't intend to leave Puerto Rico to live in New York. So I refer to Pura as the unintentional migrant. Um, she came to New York to attend her sister's wedding, uh, and she ended up staying. So she didn't migrate with the sense, I'm leaving my country, I'm going to go and find my fortune in the United States. That wasn't necessarily in her mind. My uncle, Enrique Godó, knew her in Puerto Rico, and they used to hang out together, you know, with a group. And if they, that was in San Juan. And that was during the time that uh, she was in uh, a beauty pageant, because Pura, as a young person, a young woman, was very, very, very handsome. And um, she was sought after, from what I hear, from what I heard from my uncle when he used to tell me. Actually, Pura came to this country in 1920, 1920, I believe, and my uncle came about the same time. The NYPL at the turn of the 20th century created uh, one of the world's first system-wide services for kids, children's rooms. Um, and they hired uh, this phenomenal figure in library history, Ann Carol Moore, uh, to run. She was the, the top administrator of, of, of the children's rooms. And she had tremendous vision. And she also, um, she was also a, a firm internationalist. And if you remember it, uh, you know, from history, that the, the, the turn of the 20th century was the peak of the big wave of migration to the United States. Huge migration. New York, New York City was a polyglot city with all sorts of different discrete ethnic enclaves. And so Moore decided that in order to reach, to properly do outreach with the kids in each of these neighborhoods in the library service area, she needed to hire assistants who ideally were from those communities, who spoke the native language or languages of, of the people in those communities, who knew the folklore and the fairy tales of those communities, um, so that, that they, they would be more effective in the library and, uh, in recruiting kids. And so Buda Belpre was the Puerto Rican hired to do just that. Soon they reached Martina's balcony. Buenos dias, Senorita Martina, said both at the same time. Will you marry me? Ah, oh, but Senores, said Martina, you forget your manners. You cannot speak both to me at the same time. Senor Cricket, will you speak first? Senorita Martina, will you marry me? Or perhaps, said Martina, if you tell me how you would speak to me in the future. Oh, I will speak to you like this. Oh, Senor Cricket, what makes your voice so sad? You will make me cry. No, I will not marry you. And now, Senor Frog, it's your turn to speak. Senorita Martina, will you marry me? Or oh, perhaps, Senor Martina, if you tell me how you would speak to me in the future. Senorita, says Senor Frog, I will speak to you like this. Barum, barum. Barum, barum. Oh, no, no, Senor Frog. I will not marry you. I do not like your voice. And besides, I have heard that you frogs speak constantly, day and night. <laughs> well, she never intended to work in a library. But she did get a, an important job in her career was her first job in the New York Public Library in 1921. Buddha was well read, not just in Puerto Rican literature or folklore. She was widely read in many areas. She also read in English and in French, because her father was a French abstract, and the grandmother, I believe, was also a French, and she knew French literature. So coming from Puerto Rico in 1921, um, she was going to become a, a teacher, and she wanted to get a degree in teaching at UPR. So within the realm of library work, there's a formal ritual of storytelling. And in the 
branch that she was working in in the New York Public Library at that time. Um, the librarians were interested in telling folkloric stories. And Belpre was not a librarian. She was a library assistant. And we don't know exactly what her tasks were, but generally speaking, librarian assistants straighten up the shelves. Sometimes they may help people find books. When she was transferred to the, I believe it was the 115th Street branch, at that time it was still Italian and Puerto Rican community. And so she worked with a colleague named Maria Chamino, who was the Italian abstract. And they were the ones who decided that they were going to celebrate festive holidays from both groups either by song or dance or storytelling sessions in both Italian and in Spanish. And they would invite the public to come, uh, children, parents, and grandparents. It would be several days they would celebrate these. And it was well attended, well liked, and it was done annually. So one of the tasks that she talks about being instructed to do early in her career was to read the shelves of children's books that were fairy tales and folkloric tales. <coughs> and she thought she would encounter some books or stories that came from Puerto Rico, and she didn't find any. So she thought this, she identified this as a gap, and she thought that there was something missing and something that she could add. And then she also went out to outreach and started going to various community centers and churches and schools and started giving all sorts of storytelling session hours there for free. Um, and wherever she went, she was known, and people called for her to do these stories. Um, and towards the end of her life, she was approaching like 70, and she was still taking public transportation and buses and, <laughs> and trains. So it, that's amazing, the spirit she had, the energy she had, um, and the determination to bring forth these stories to, uh, to help beloved children, basically. The public library offered her the opportunity to go to librarian school. At that time, the New York Public Library had its own librarian school at the main branch of the New York Public Library on Fifth Avenue. So she went to librarian school, and as a part of her training, she had to tell a story so again, the library had a fairly formal approach to storytelling. Um, so they would train storytellers. Um, and one imagines, therefore, the Pura del Pre style as a storyteller both incorporated how she naturally did it, how she learned to do it from her family, how she did it as a young girl, because she talks about telling stories while she was in school as a student. But also it incorporated um, the formal style that the New York Public Library trained her in. She engaged in outreach to the Latino community, uh, being that um, back then, which is part of New York Public Library's history, reaching out to immigrants to attract them to come to the library. So she was the first one who actually reached out to um, the Spanish-speaking community and to let them know that the library was for them also. Um, and then the fact that she published the materials and uh, had bilingual storytelling sessions in the various libraries that she worked with. Initially, she requested permission to tell some of the Puerto Rican stories that she knew in the 135th Street Library. And initially, there was resistance because those stories had not been published. But she was persistent, and over time, they said, yes, you can tell your stories, only you have to be sure to tell the children that these stories will probably be published in a book at some point in the future. Which is a little bit humorous in the present because it's very much of an adult professional librarian concept that stories should be in books. It's not the kind of thing that children would necessarily expect. So it's, um, funny, but it also speaks to Belpre feeling committed to Puerto Rican culture, to sharing Puerto Rican culture with the children that were coming to the library, and to finding a place for Puerto Rican culture, creating that place. It also did create the motivation for her to write down these stories. It was getting late. 
and Martina decided to go into her house. But before she did so, she happened to look down the street. And whom should she see coming but Perez, the man dressed in his best clothes and wearing a straw hat with a long plume. Martina sat again on her chair and she fixed her little dress. She watched Perez as he walked slowly down the street. She saw him as he took off his hat and bowed low to his friends in the street. Soon he reached her balcony. He took off his hat and made a low bow. Buenos dias, señorita Martina, said señor Perez. Buenos dias, señor Perez, said Martina. Señorita, it is a beautiful day. Will you come out and take your walk with me? But Martina said she preferred her balcony and invited Perez to come and sit next to her. Perez went slowly in, and as he went, he sang, España un ratoncito soy, en una cueva vivo, puedo por las tardes ver la puesta del sol, a veces veo al rey y a la reina pasar. Señorita, says señor Perez, for a long time I've had a question to ask you, will you marry me? Or perhaps a Martina, if you tell me how you would speak to me in the future. Señorita, says Señor Perez, I will speak to you in the language of my forefathers, like this. Chui, 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 chui. Oh, how lovely, said Martina. It sounds <laughs> just like music. Yes, yes, Señor Perez, I will marry you. So there was a fairly clear and direct uh, request for her to write these stories so that they could continue to be told and that it wouldn't raise questions about telling stories that were just stories held orally. The publications ensured the fact that these, these, these stories, these folk tales that she told, that she learned as a child, would be here now for people to use. And that these folk tales in some ways symbolize their importance as part of being part of the family of the, uh, of the world and contributing to the literature of the world. And they were married, and a grand wedding it was. They danced and they sang, and there were many Spanish dance Senorita Martina did for her parents. Christmas was coming, and Martina wanted to give Perez a good surprise. What shall I fix for him? said she. Oh, I know. There is a Christmas dish I am sure Perez has never tasted. I shall make it for him. You read these stories. It's a different experience than reading Hans Christian Andersen or reading uh, The Brothers Grimm or even reading a collection of, of you know, a more recent collection of, of more feminist types, uh, type of folklore. It is just a fundamentally unique experience to read about characters that you can identify with. And she started publishing her books. Perez and Martina was one of them. The Tiger and the Rabbit was another. By 1940, she had gone to Cincinnati to present a paper on, on library service to the Hispanic community. And that's where she met her husband, Clarence Cameron White, who was a musician, African-American background. Um, she briefly took a leave of absence from the library and then left the library in 1945 and left for about 17 years. Her husband dies in 1960 from a heart attack and then she comes back to the library to work. Um, first as a Spanish children's specialist and then she worked for the South Bronx Project with Lillian. That was the time when she got married and I believe she wanted to be with him. Um, um, traveling with him and, and just being uh, a wife. I believe that was her intention and uh, perhaps the right, but uh, I think she wanted to devote time to her husband and her new life. Thank you for having made my married life so happy, so rich in spiritual and material things. Thanks for your patience and tolerance. Thanks most of all 
for having shared your love of music with me. Thanks to this last thing for the large number of friends I have made, for the knowledge of worthwhile personalities which have come through the sharing of books and talks with you which have rounded me up and made of me a more understanding person and a better companion for that. Especially because he has such a, he has a classical music, you know, history. Uh, he was, went to Oberlin, one of the most prestigious conservatories. His mother went to Oberlin. So he comes from, also, from uh, intellectual and, and classical music royalty. His, his, he studied with Coleridge Taylor in Europe. Oh, I mean, can you imagine what it must have been like to be Pura and this man together? What a pity we didn't know those two together, you know? Yeah. I didn't meet her physically until I was an adult, m much later. But Lillian and my sister Evelina knew her. When I was little, they knew who Pura Bebre was. They knew that she was a family friend and that she was a librarian at the, li you know, the Avila Library. I was already, you know, with children when, when we made the connection, and that was in the 60s. I didn't meet her until 1961. I was um, a trainee in the library, and we happened to meet at the Morrisania branch. And I knew about her, and I knew who she was, and everything, but I didn't want to tell her. So I just, we were talking, and she was so happy that he was another Puerto Rican who wanted to be a librarian. And uh, I didn't, you know, I was a little uh, shy, and I said, do you know this person? Uh, I just mentioned a name. And she said, oh yes, do you know him? And I, just, I said, oh yes, he visits my house all the time. So <laughs> then we started talking and I told her about my uncle and she said, oh, that was a great thing for her. And I think from that day, we sort of became friends. Martina and Perez form the, the culture. Is, is, is the, is the, is the uh, how would I put it? Is the culture is a cultural bridge from Spain to Latin America, Spain to Latin America. In, I, I, I say it that way because you can find versions of Perez and Martina in all of them. Yeah, Perez and Martina is not only a Puerto Rican classic. It's it's a story that Pura researched and found all over the world. It's a global story for some reason. She found a version of it um, in a collection of folk tales from Iran, for example. Um, and she's, she also mentioned that the only story in which Martina is not a cockroach is in the Spanish story in Spain, uh, in which she's represented or she's, she's personified as a black ant. Okay? Um, Perez and Martina is a hysterical, it's, it's hysterical in the telling, but it has a really brutal and horrible ending. You know, and, and that's, that's really a hallmark of something uh, definitely authentic. Pura Belpe initially told stories that I think she had heard as a child. So she says in her essays that her grandmother would tell her these stories. So these were stories that she had only heard. She had never seen them written. And that was really where her stories originally came from in her early career of storytelling. I think as time went by, she began to do more research on stories. And later in her career, she talks about going to Puerto Rico and doing some research on stories. But initially, I think her stories were stories that she heard as a child. She went to the kitchen and she took the kettle. She put inside some rice, some coconut juice, some almonds and raisins. She added some sugar and mixed it well. 
Then she added some water and put the pot to boil. Then she went around the house making it tidy for the grand affair. Originally, folkloric stories were entertainment for people of all ages. And as I said, in the present, in writing down those stories and trying to hold on to them as a form of the heritage of a community or of a people, they have been received as children's literature. And that's fine, but that's not what their origin is. When publishing became a, a, an industry, uh, books for children tended to become more pedantic. Right? Uh, the folklore was not really authentic. The folklore was adulterated, it was changed in order to meet uh, the sensibilities of uh, their projected audience. She had hardly departed when Philip came in. He immediately smelled the new dish. It is a completely new smell, said He followed the smell to the kitchen. There he saw the kettle. But it was too high for him to see what was inside. So he drew a stool and stepped on it. He peeped inside. Ah, said Philip, if it tastes as good as it looks, I am in certainly for a good treat. Then he stuck in his paw and tasted it. And when he did so, he knew he had never tasted anything like that before. He bit again. Him he noticed an almond getting brown all over. If I could only get it, said Philip. One good pull, and it will be mine. And I wonder what, what sort of interest treasures I would have done for, for Martina. Well, you say, well, you, you, you did the puppets. You created the puppets. I said, that's right. But uh, through what I, what I heard, I've been telling them, telling this story for such a long time, that it became very alive. But, but no, that's it, alive. That is the word for Pérez and Martina. It will never die. What you're doing, walking down the street, feeling that beat, digging on you like you're digging on me. <laughs> the word. <laughs> it's so funny. It's a I'm a I'm a I'm a When I got here and I saw that the story of Cucarachita Martina was so popular. Not only Cucarachita, Juan Bobo, the stories of Juan Bobo, very popular. So I said, you know, I, I decided to do adaptations of her work and also of other uh, versions of the story that we have in Puerto Rico and, and created uh, shows for our kids. Because I don't think that we don't have a Pura Pre right now that was reading in the school. So in a certain way, I'm taking like that role, but doing it through theater. One highly popular activity here was the creation of a puppet theater. Puppet shows were given in Spanish and English, and the puppets soon took the road to hospitals, schools, and during the summer, in the parks. This is a hand puppet. Um, in puppetry, we have many different styles, and this, I imagine that you know this is a style that she um, she used because I see many of her other puppets and it's, that's, uh, they're all the same style. And it's uh, usually made out of a paper mache, the head and the hands. In this case, I believe that this is made out of cast. Um, and um, because paper mache, you know, these puppets are really, really old. You know, they're uh, close to uh, 90 years, years old. And I am very, very surprised of how great they have been preserved. All the libraries, um, not only in the Bronx, but the ones that the New York Public Library had, you know, there was very, very little for Spanish-speaking people, readers. And this is how Lillian came up with it, that she felt that, you know, this was especially in this borough, you know, of the Bronx, where there were many Latinos and Puerto Ricans, that that was needed. So there were nine libraries involved in the project that Lillian was uh, uh, responsible for. The funny part is that the project expanded 
from, from the South Bronx, which was one project. Eventually, it was eight different components. It was the Blacks. It was in different areas of the city, the Lower East Side, Staten Island, and Central Holland, which has started its own project before, the year before, but then they were all put under my supervision. And we worked very well together, regardless of what group it was. Pura came to work on the project after the children's librarian who could speak both languages and would tell stories all over. And everything grew, and Pura uh, and I became closer as we were working on this project. And all those libraries, I'm sure, you know, were visited by Buddha, the Hunts Point, Fremont. They were they were just scattered all over Marasania. And um, what they did was Lillian brought in uh, more books for Spanish uh, Spanish readers and had Buddha also Pretty Thomas. She brought Pretty Thomas. She brought quite a few uh, artists to different programs. And the people, I mean, they, they used to get packed. The, the audiences were just hungering. They hungered for, for this. The best years of my life were spent during the time that I was on the children's caravan. Now you may ask what the children's caravan is. Well, it was developed by Maud Schindel, who is a creator of children's video, starting with film strip uh, back in the day on to um, eight millimeters and uh, 16 millimeter and video of any sort that he could find uh, to reproduce children's works. And went down into the hole, Stacy, and went to sleep. Hello, Dad. Not there. only did we have these materials, but the children's caravan was a very interesting piece of equipment because it was a mobile library. It was on wheels, and we traveled from school to school. Inside the caravan, we or the vehicle, we had red carpet where children could sit. We had rare projection screens. We had we had in the beginning a telephone that we could call out. And we had books that children could borrow. And uh, we had an art easel that they could, after hearing a story or seeing a film, they could reproduce something attractive and take back to school. She put together a number of bibliographies that were later published, Libros in Espanol. New York Public Library put that together, her and a couple of other of her colleagues. Um, and she was adamant about the importance of bilingual education for children and the importance of making sure that they knew their Spanish, of course they had to learn English, and that they understood the importance of their, their stories, their folk tales, their culture, basically. So she was an advocate that way for bilingual education, um, being that she was trilingual in her own way. In that year, and I don't remember, it was somewhere in the 70s, but I don't remember exactly what year, we named this vehicle the Pura Belpre children's caravan. Now, of course, we uh, called uh, Pura Belpre, uh, the supervisor at the time, Lucille Thomas, called uh, Pura Belpre to get her permission. And uh, Pura Belpre was delighted. And she came for the opening ceremony. We always had ceremonies. We were always um, uh, 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 enjoying uh, the works of authors and um, illustrators, because that was the big thing for us at the time. Well, poor Belpre was a lovely person. She was so gracious about having her name for this vehicle that went from school to school. And that's what we did. We went to a school, and children would come to the vehicle. We do our storytelling inside. They'd leave, uh, they'd do some kind of creative dramatics or or creative work, uh, they would make a freeze and take it back to class, and then they would leave. And we had a schedule, and all the while, there was this big sign on the outside of our vehicle 
the poor of Belpre children's caravan. My very favorite is called Ines. And it's uh, one of her unpublished stories. And I mentioned earlier that you know, this, many of the stories that she didn't publish during her lifetime are about girls. And they're also the most magical of all the stories. It almost seems as if to empower the female characters, you know, the world time-space continuum has to be warped in some way, shape, or form. It, it's, it's almost as if she has had to change reality itself in order to center these female characters in these stories, to make it possible for them to have the types of powers that they eventually have and that they display. I definitely uh, saw her many times at the Electoral Bookstore on 14th Street. Uh, we used to have a children's theater on the second floor, and she used to perform uh, some of her puppet shows right there at the second floor. Um, before the performance and after the performance, she would come down, it was on the second floor, to the store and spend some time with the children that they were there and talk to them. And it was just amazing to see her among the children. Inez is a perfect example of that. She's the daughter of a woodcutter, and she lives on the edge of the Luquillo forest. And her father goes to work first thing in the morning, comes back, you know, right after sunset, and so she's left to her own devices every day. Um, and she has no friends. She has no neighbors. Because she talks to the trees. She talks to the plants. She talks to the mountains. Um, and her best friend is the Dama de la Noche vine, you know, this uh, night blooming jessamine vine. And um, so it's super fantastical. This is what I mean about the, the elements being so otherworldly. She had a powerful voice um, and a very penetrating, uh, you know, um, eyes. I mean, when, when she talked to her audience and the children, she always had her eyes on the children and moved them from child to child, and her voice was incredible. She had the gift of a voice that was unbelievable. She ends up going out into the world. She gets helped uh, by three people, two really nice crones, right? Uh, old witches who are really super sweet people, not, you know, wicked witches, um, and a farmer. And she ends up spreading the gift, the, the spreading the flamboyant tree, the color of the flamboyant tree, and the seeds of the flamboyant tree all around the island of Puerto Rico. It's like a really exciting her hero story, only it's a heroine. Right? She's the brave one. She's the one that kills the, the, the evil frog and frees the little horse, you know? And there's lots of stories like that in her, in her collection in her unpublished papers. The conversations that we had, it was always about books, about the bookstore, about children, how we could get children more motivated to read, how we can get parents, and especially Latino parents, um, more in tune to reading with their children at home. It was always, at least our conversations, about books. If you just read what she published, you would only have a, a fraction of a view of her entire literary output. And you would have a very skewed view of what she was writing. Because publishers publish because they're marketing books and they have certain things in mind. Um, but thank goodness we have her archives here, as we have the full breadth of the stories that she invented. I've been very fortunate to have received the Puerto Belpre Medal twice, once for Esperanza Rising and once for The Dreamer. And I've received the Pura Belpre honor for my book, Becoming Naomi Leon. So I have been asked before, was it any different when you win subsequent times? And I have to say that it becomes even more special because it continues to validate the reason that I sit down to write every day. Thank you.
cree, es un premio que otorga a la American Library Association en Estados Unidos. I grew up in California, and Puerto Bell Pre was the first uh, Latino children's librarian in, in New York City, the New York Public Library. So I didn't ever really grow up having knowledge of her, and she was a little before my time. Um, when I became entrenched in the children's literature world as an adult, I was familiar with her picture book. La casa editora que me ha publicado algunos libros sometió mi libro Federico García Lorca para este premio. Antes se había sometido, se habían sometido algunos libros míos para este premio, pero mis libros tenían la desventaja de que están escritos en español. Y encima de que están escritos en español, están escritos en versos. Y al traducirlos para la gente del jurado que iba a escoger la mejor obra, pues perdía, porque no es lo mismo traducir una obra en prosa que traducir una obra en verso. O sea, no, porque en verso no es solo lo que dice, sino cómo se dice. Pero en esta ocasión había en este jurado personas que hablaban español y entonces por primera vez una obra escrita en español, solamente en español, porque ya habían ganado obras bilingües, una obra escrita solamente en español ganó esta mención de honor. So this is the cover of Dear Primo, and the artwork is very much inspired by uh, pre-Columbian Mexi Mexican art, by the ancient art of Mexico, and in particular by uh, Mixtec art, by uh, Mixtec Codex. Um, and so, like the characters are always drawn in profile, <coughs> and I try and use different things like the ears um, that sort of take motifs from, uh, from those codex. As an adult, when I became entrenched in the children's literature world, I was familiar with her book, Perez and Martina, about a cockroach and a mouse. Um, but it wasn't until I received my first Puta del Prey medal that her life and her legacy um, you know, became important to me after discovering her career. I understood the bridges that she crossed to bring Latino literature to the people of New York City. The one reason how I came up with this artwork is I was doing a project while I was in college about a, uh, an undocumented worker. Um, and he, had, he was a mixtec. And a lot of the people here in New York, a lot of the uh, Mexican workers are mixtecos. And, um, and so I was telling the story about this guy I know named Sergio, who I met at this, um, at this worker center. And I thought his story was fascinating of how he came and how he sort of got involved in community organizing. And, uh, and his first language is uh, Mixtec, and he was sort of talking it with other guys that he knew. And so then when I was sort of trying to come up with an art style for the project, I went to, the, to Gimbal, which is the library at Parsons, the art library. And I took a bunch of books on pre-Columbian art, and I saw mixed the codex. Ella tenía la facultad de ser una narradora nata. Por esto quiero decir que venía de la tradición del cuento oral. Ella narraba, contaba. Era más que cuentista, cuentera en la tradición de la literatura oral. Y esto lo llevaba también a la página escrita. Así que fue un gran placer y un reto darle imágenes a esas palabras que ya de por sí estaban cargadas de imágenes porque ella narraba sobre todo para niños y sabía que había que pintar con las palabras, decirlo de tal modo de que el niño pudiera imaginar ese suceder. She was a real symbol of change. She brought uh, the, the immigrant stories and the dignity of the culture into, um, into American life, I, I feel. And, and, she, um, and she introduced people to the magical um, folk um, uh, material that came from her culture. She was proud of it. 
She talked about it to everybody. She uh, was part of a larger world in that she wrote papers and she uh, agitated for more and more um, uh, Latino um, uh, involvement in the life of the library. And I think she was extremely successful and she was beloved. Tenía que ver con un caballo que aparecía con los colores del arco iris, caballo mágico, un caballo que transportaba la imaginación y cumplía los deseos de quienes lo observaban. Para mí fue un viaje extraordinario en las palabras de Doña Pura y lograr que, ya que yo estaba recién mudado a una casa en el campo, tenía todos los referentes de la naturaleza frente a mí. Ahí podía, y tenía, eh, mis niños estaban pequeños, Así que yo los posaba a ellos. Eh, fue... Ahora me da mucha alegría recordarlo, porque hace tiempo que no pensaba en ese trabajo. Y recordarlo es también recordar a Doña Pura, recordar a mis hijos en ese entonces y en ese paraje tan bello. Now there's a long tradition here. And Pura is one of the brightest stars in that early, you know, the first half of the 20th century with the, with the, the writing that she did. I mean, her career spans most of the 20th century. She's born in 1899 and dies in 1982, and she's active all the way up until the very end of her life. Um, so what, what, does she, what has she given us in the, in the diaspora? Well, she is one of our major cultural intellectuals. He put one, but it didn't come out. He put once more, it shook just a little. One hard pull, and it will be mine. He gave it one hard pull, but unfortunately he lost his balance and he fell inside the pot. He cried and called for help. But who could help him? Martina was the only one, and she was away sweeping her patio. After a while, she came in to see how her dish was getting along, and took a wooden spoon to give it a good stirring. When she looked inside the pot, there she saw her Perez cooked to death. She cried and called him, Senor Perez, come back to me. Then he went to her room and put on a black dress and a black mantilla. She took her guitar from the wall and she sat on her chair, playing, singing, and crying. And her little voice went all over the place as she sang, El ratoncito Pérez cayó en la olla y la cucaracha Martina lo canta y lo llora, lo canta y lo llora, lo canta y lo llora, lo canta y lo llora. And to this day, she still plays, she still sings, she still cries for her parents to come back to her.
no, no, no. Uh, that's okay. Don't, don't worry about that. Uh, everybody can hear, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. We're good. No, 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 no. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. About it. Yeah. <laughs> Like you to move a little bit more to the yeah, side. No, that's why they want the mic is under yeah. the under the yeah, table. Yeah, they, they wanted to move. Oh, they want to move? Yeah, they wanted to move a little bit. I think it's gonna be that long. So <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm Lisa Sanchez Gonzalez, uh, Associate Professor of English at the University of Connecticut. I'm actively recruiting graduate students. If anyone's interested, talk to me afterwards. And she's also the uh, biographer of uh, Pura Vespre. Uh, her book will be coming up, coming up soon. <laughs> Yeah, that was, I, we actually, because the room was so hot, we had to take the, the, the paper clip from the manuscript of her biography and clip it back because my hair was falling on the mic. Mm -hmm. My name is uh, Camille Rodriguez, I don't know if you don't know me. Um, I had the honor and privilege of uh, working side by side with Frank Bonilla for more than 20 years. And uh, currently, my, my background is in education. I don't have a PhD, contrary to the film, and I never pretended to have a PhD, but uh, it's in, in the film. Um, and my background is in education and higher education. I'm currently serving as documentarian, part of the team of documentarians for the new community college that's being created in the city of New York. Mm -hmm. So anyway, well, First time I saw Pura Pelpre's uh, film, and it, it was just fascinating to me to see the theme of two pioneering individuals from the Puerto Rican community who affirmed who they were um, and took it along with them along their career trajectory, who made connections, a very strong connections to the African American community, who made connections in other ways later on in their career. And at the same time, um, encountered uh, challenges and opportunities that they took advantage of, 
and uh, it, it was, I was just so struck by um, that history, that connectiveness, and willingness to give back to the community that was so much a part of their lives, both of them. I, I had a, a conversation uh, with somebody because I lived in New York for a long time and when I moved to Boston, like here in New York we have such a close relationship with the African American community. So, you know, you're used to being together, you know, and, and sharing. So when, when I moved to Boston, it was like, like I would be very friendly towards the African American uh, compañeros that I had. And they were shocked, like, you know, they said, they, they, they it was hard for them to, so they didn't under, uh, understand it. And I forget who I was talking to about this issue because I feel that, and I think that the, that the film in, in that sense answers a little bit of the questions and in the sense that it started, you know, the, the it, we started in Harlem, you know, East Harlem, Black Harlem. So like things, I think that the, the relationships started really when you see the film from the beginning of the century almost. So it's, it's the, the Puerto Rican community here in New York is very different from mm -hmm. other communities in other parts of the, uh, of the U.S. because you know, I know the Chicago community, the Connecticut community, the Boston community, Philadelphia, and it's not the relationships with the, with the, with the African American community are, are not as strong as here. If you look at it historically, though, that those are two very key fundamental points. I mean, the 1920s, where the, there was the African-American migration beginning to come north um, uh, during the time that Puerto Ricans were coming in more significant numbers, and again in the 1950s and, and the Great Migration during that period. So, you know, that intensity of those migration periods it, for, for the African American community, it was the Great Migration from the South North again, and for us coming um, from Puerto Rico here. Well, and and these are just two of our great pion pioneros mm -hmm. and pioneras. This is why I need grad students. There's a ton of material here. The archives are an amazing and unique resource here at. Uh, well, now we're not at Hunter College. Mm -hmm. This is the. Well, it's here, schools. No? but the the the, the, uh, are the archives, archives here? are here in this yeah. building now. Yeah, yeah. they were moved. Um, there's Jesus Colon, uh, Antonia Pantojas. Uh, there's there, there, at least a dozen different figures that we we have uh, very little research published about uh, figures like Colon, who worked very closely um, not only with the CPUSA but also with African American organizers during the, the, the radicalism, the communist radicalism of the 1930s and 40s. So um, that's what struck me tonight. You know, these two wonderful lives, um, there's so many more. We, need, we really, and, and Frank Bonilla's vision to create a little reading room and the mutual support for scholarship has, has I think, the, its greatest blossom in the, uh, the greatest legacy is in, in the archives themselves, which are phenomenal, phenomenal. Are, are there any archivists here? I can't really see. Yay! <laughs> I think that you make yeah. it all possible. The, the, other, uh, the other piece was the, the, um, the reaching into the community. I think uh, one of the pieces that was not exactly elaborated in, 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 in the film on Frank's life was the fact that a large part of the struggle of gaining access to uh, higher education to the City University of New York was opening it up to the community. And so we spent in those early days many hours functioning on 24-hour schedules practically at, at different times, but where people were coming in from the community who were not identified as professors or scholars or students. And a lot of the struggle in building the library and archives always was with the administration in terms of giving them access, uh, giving the community equal access to those those resources in those uh, in the center and in the in the, uh, the library. I don't want to interrupt your flow, but I, I, want, I wanted to applaud you uh, for 
for uh, giving uh, more of an opportunity for us to see what's in the archive uh, in both films. Mm -hmm. And also, I was here yesterday, and they had the Antonia Pantoja film, mm -hmm. and, and to uh, sustain a thread that you mentioned, she also affirmed her African American, uh, mm -hmm. you know, identity or uh, black identity. Right. Uh, and you look at even Arturo Schomburg as well. So I mean, th these four, uh, you know, uh, folks, in Jesus Colon, could easily be spoken about in you know African American History Month as well. And maybe there's a way of mm -hmm. weaving them in that. I mean, you know, I, I don't think most folks would ever make that connection easily, you know, yeah. uh, about them. Uh, and, I, and I wanted also to say that I, I was uh, fortunate enough to take a class with Frank Bonilla, and then more recently I finished library school and I studied the uh, the Cura Ventre, uh, uh, archives here. And she had wonderful letters with her husband, mm -hmm. where, where I think they. I, I'm glad you dramatized it with, with Miriam Colon, but you could easily have almost like a novella of just their mm -hmm. letters to each other and very affectionate and very mm -hmm. uh, and, and just about daily life and just. Uh, you know, where she met him in, it was at a conference in Cincinnati. But so I want to uh, applaud you for, you know, mm -hmm. for uh, this effort and, and, uh, and many more if, if budgets can sustain uh, mm -hmm. and you're willing to keep going on this, I, I would applaud you. Well, you know, the uh, one thing is uh, there's such a small amount of time when you're doing this that there's so much that is left out. And one thing that I really would have ex loved to explore uh, was uh, how the the Harlem Rena Renaissance affect these people, mm -hmm. you know, affect uh, Jesus Colon, Buddha, Schomburg, you know, and the relationship there. But, you know, the time is very limited. But that's why we're, they're doing a book on Pura Arte. And, uh, and I think that a book has to be written about Frank because there's so much that was left out also uh, in, in Frank's documentary um, that re we really do need. Uh, a book written about his contribution. Uh, and the other little scoop is that we're negotiating now to do, maybe we're going to be doing Jesus Colón next. Nice. So, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, let's see if we can reach an yeah. agreement. Yeah. The other thread that, that, that runs through this is that both of them were also um, uh, built bridges uh, to generations. I mean, the thread that uh, one of the themes in Frank's, um, the film on Frank, was this connection in, in, uh, in encouraging uh, scho scholars from students of color. Um, and um, in Pura Pelpre, clearly, in terms of the younger generation. So this, this, this passing on of the legacy uh, and encouraging the future and the role that education played in that um, is so critical, um, and you know, part I, I'm really applauding the idea that these will be tools, educational tools, mm -hmm. um, and I love the uh, in both instances the connections to other Latino groupings and to the international arena, uh, the connections that, that that are suggested that could still be developed even further, because I think it it this is the kind of information that is still not inserted into the college classroom, let alone the classrooms in secondary and primary <coughs> education. And uh, particularly since at a time that um, we, we've seen a decrease, I mean, since I'm so passionate about the higher education experience, we see a decreasing presence of Puerto Rican students uh, in the system. And I, I think there has to be another very aggressive effort to reach out in the same way that both Frank and Pura Pelpre went into the community with this information as a resource, as, a, as another alternative to what is not being provided in the institutions currently. Um, uh, uh, two comments, just to piggyback. Uh, the other day I had gone up to uh, um, the Upper West Side and I was looking for some old literature books that I had read when I was little in Puerto Rico. And, um, and there was a gentleman that came and we were talking and he said, you know, I just want to thank the Puerto Rican community. And he was, he's Dominican. And um, he said, I just want to thank the Puerto Ricans because, because of your effort and what you have done, that you have paved the road for us and other Spanish immigrants, it's made things very easy. 
And you know, I never thought about it that way. And you just, you just, you had mentioned it. Um, and so that was very nice to hear that. And then on the other thing that you had just mentioned as well, that it is something that we do need back again. Um, some type of movement or, you know, a shot in the arm or something like that. Because I have two children that are in um, one elementary and one in middle. And this is one of my things right now. I guess maybe I got, I'm a little bit older and I'm a little more uh, melancholic or homesick, you know, just to uh, get to experience my roots again and live it. But um, that is one of the things, one of my pet peeves, um, that they are not teaching um, anything about our culture or, I mean, look at this. This is again, here we go. Not only that it was the Puerto Ricans, but we had the blacks and we were able to help each other. Um, and so that's not being taught at all. Our kids are, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, you, you take it maybe, a, what is it, a semester perhaps when you get to college. But in the meantime, the kids don't know about their own culture or the history, the rich history um, that we know. Or, I mean, this is just beautiful and amazing. And thank you for bringing it to our, our neck of the woods over here. I do appreciate it. I just want to add to that that, that one, of the, one of the pieces that still needs to be fleshed out more, particularly in terms of the early history of the Centro, was that while it was uh, really um, Puerto Rican driven, there were so many non-Puerto Ricans who were involved in those early days that helped build our agenda. They included Dominicans. I mean, they included uh, you know Cubans. They included uh, um, many other you know folks who were participating and helping to support that agenda. And part of that history has to be also remembered. Um, so, and I think Ramona mentions it a little bit in, in her uh, presentation on the film. But there's, each of these films, I think, gives us the suggestions of new directions that we can go with, you know, uncovering or reclaiming the history for our community and, and building on that history. Yeah. And I just want to add that um, while I've been waiting patiently for the Centro de Estudios Puerto Riqueños to publish the Belfre book, which uh, actually is, is her biography and then selections of her published stories and her unpublished stories, but also her unpublished essays in which she talks about her, or her, her work in the children's rooms. Um, there's tons of them. You know, just selecting uh, you know, the, the 12 or 15 for each segment of the book was, was really difficult because she was a brilliant woman. Um, I agree with Vicki that, that she uh, learned oral storytelling techniques uh, at home as a kid, but she was also a researcher. She was in, in communication. There are letters with some of the major folklorists at the UPR during uh, the 40s and 50s and 60s. She, she, she wasn't a naive storyteller. Um, but uh, one of the problems we have with outreach into the schools, and I can't speak about contemporary stuff here. I live in Connecticut where you know, we're a huge population there too. Um, without this, you know, resources like the Centro to, 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 to help with the research and the outreach. And what I've discovered uh, through working with the Curbstone Foundation is that um, Teachers can't find the materials that they want and need to do this type of work. Uh, so after I finished the Belpre book, I went ahead and wrote a collection of Puerto Rican folk tales. And that was just finished um, on Halloween. And uh, for, my agent is looking for a, a publisher. Uh, we don't have much young adult fiction. We don't have those literary biographies. We don't have history chapbooks that kids can check out at the public library that document all of this, written for 12, you know, kindergarten through six, or middle school age, or high school age, or whatever the demographics are. And we need to work on that. I mean, this is why I want graduate students. <laughs> mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a need out there, there's a demand out there, and yes, there's, there's still structural problems with institutional racism out there. 
But when the teachers do, and I've, I've taught and, and given tons of talks to, to huge groups of teachers up in Connecticut, when they do express a desire to include this material in their curriculum, they can't find the material. So, so with that comment, perhaps now that we have this beautiful symbol here in, in, in East Harlem or Barrio, maybe there's something that, I mean, that's, that's what I came here to, I mean, not only this, but just to kind of chit chat and see if there is going to be something for our kids, um, as as a I'm concerned as a mother, um, I'm concerned as as a citizen that um, uh, that the kids are not learning their history or their culture, and it's not about being black or white or Puerto Rican or what, but but the books do not reflect what really what history what the history is going on nowadays, and so that's. That's something that you know I've been trying to be an advocate, and and my daughter goes, one of my daughters goes to a gifted school, and I just thought, oh, this is great. And if I was to tell you, I, I <laughs> the work is not even halfway there, and she goes to a good school, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's just very frustrating. They get Spanish language twice a week, and. Uh, Nothing, you know, bury the books. I mean, my, my daughter's bored. One of, so, the, one of the strategies that I, I'm, I'm, one of the strategies that I use, that I've been using now, um, I'm, I'm documenting the experience of the creation of a new community college, and the, the new community college is going to be very much based on uh, New York City. And so one of the things that I'm uh, constantly suggesting to the faculty and staff working on the design of this college is reclaiming the history of communities of color in the formation of the city. So I have been recommending Jesus Colon as, as, as examples of, of uh, uh, the contributions and, and, and some of the work that, uh, um, you know, uh, um, Bernardo Vega and some of this other work that uh, we've collected in the library and archives. And I have even suggested, because recognizing that publishers don't, they have a short lifespan with uh, literature coming from communities of color. And so I offer to copy them and give it to them as a resource <laughs> because it, it's just, they're out of print, they're non-existent. Uh, uh, so that's a way of constantly reminding people that this city was made from the bottom up, not from the top down. That's okay. Okay, I somebody okay. I have my three different uh, things I want to say and ask. First of all, um, I, as you were speaking, and because of what you're saying, I was thinking of my daughter's experience with ballet hispanico. You know, ballet hispanico goes from school to school. They have this program where they take dance to to these schools, the elementary school, middle school. So I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could get funding for this? Because it's all about money. But if we could get money to to have like a component of this pub, these public events that the center is creating, mm -hmm. and and take them to schools or take some uh, or some mm -hmm. component of the work being done in the libraries, if the if that could be shared in if there's some curriculum could be developed to take to 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 the schools. That's that's kind of an idea. But it, it, you know, that's elaborate. I mean, it, it sounds so simple, but at the same time, I know it would take a lot. Then my other thing is, I wanted, I was curious, Lisa, how you discovered uh, Pura Ben Fre, and you know, why you chose to write a dissertation uh, about her. I mean, I think I know the answer, but how did you discover Pura Ben Fre in, in Connecticut? Um, well, I went to grad school at UCLA. I grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, my, both my parents and one of my grandparents are from the Bronx. Uh, but we, we moved, uh, my family moved, a big chunk of my family moved out west during the mid-1960s when all the factory jobs were disappearing here. We had a, 
One of my crazy uncles uh, found a job at a noodle factory in Culver City, and everybody else followed him out there where there was work to do. Um, I was studying at UCLA at a time when Chicano studies, African American studies, Native American studies, women's studies was in a kind of apogee. It was a really big moment at UCLA in the 1980s for doing cultural studies. And there I was, the only Boricua. Uh, so I went to the library looking for the books that I saw my, my classmates reading about their own communities. And I went to the same library, which is one of the finest research libraries in the world, and didn't find a single one uh, you know, dealing with literature and cultural intellectual history. So I said, I've got to write that book. If it's not on the shelf, someone's got to do it, what, what, then I should. But there was a gap I had, because it was a literary history, uh, which included the, uh, the period between the wars. And I had read about Puta Bel Pre uh, in a footnote to some article that I had come across. And I said, well, you know, I've got to make a pilgrimage to New York City. And I'm and the centro was the place that was my mecca. So, so then, <laughs> it was the centro that really put you on course. And unfortunately, this was, uh, I believe, this was after uh, Frank Bonilla was no longer, yeah. I never got to meet him. Uh, but yeah, all the way from UCLA to New York City to work, to use these archives. And I had gone and spent a year in Puerto Rico on the, the, mis the, the, the wrong assumption the bad assumption that I would find archives and rare books of the uh, Puerto Rican diaspora at the UPR. And I spent uh, 13 months, I think it was, going to the Colección Puerto Riqueña in the uh, Lazaro Library. And the archivists there were wonderful and really helpful. But the only material I found was the work of Luisa Capetillo. Uh, and, um, when I, when I got here, there was more material that I, you know, yeah. it, was, it was like a gold mine. Yeah. And there's, there's still, I mean, Jesus Colón is a fascinating figure. Yes. His, he, in fact, he, he cut out, one of his files, one of his files is newspaper clippings of all the, uh, the things that were going on between, in the, in the African American community and the Boricua community here in New York City. Just those clippings is a kind of narrative history. Um, some of his earlier writing that no one's read, some of it is highly problematic. He was trying to reconcile his internationalism with his nationalism, and that's not an easy thing to do. Um, you know, there's a there's, there's hundred different dissertations that could be, a thousand different dissertations that could be written out of the, the holdings here. We need more students doing that work. And I, I just want to add, that's another uh, piece of history that needs to be fleshed out more in terms of, you know, um, the, 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 the linkage between Puerto Rico and the scholarship in Puerto Rico and what was happening in the United States and the resistance uh, to uh, our, those of us who were here saying we were Puerto Rican and uh, whether we were in fact Puerto Rican because we didn't speak the language well <laughs> or whether the culture we were producing. And I think one of the pieces in Frank's film which talked about the diversity of the culture uh, in the United States and in the affirmation of that diversity of the culture um, is another uh, story that has yet to unfold and be told because that was also a part of the, the tension during that period in those early days. I, I just have another my third uh, point, which is for Evaldo, um, um, I um, you talked about that there's possibly something coming up in terms of a visual, uh, 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 you know, a piece on Jesus Colon, and uh, it, there's so much. Uh, was, I do know a little bit about Jesus Colon, uh, but uh, you know, something that's fascinating and that a lot of people don't know about is, uh, you know, the tabaqueros, and, mm. you know, Jesus Colón, you know, started off, I think, as a tabaquero in, in, in Puerto Rico, and, you know, a lot of those tabaqueros were 
of African descent because there were people, you know, working in, not in agriculture, but, you know, in the towns, you know, making cigars or whatever mm -hmm. it is. And the consciousness of the tabaqueros, which was so, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you know, um, uh, so uh, uh, they were so aware of their status as as workers, a proletariat, and and how the reading they used to get be read to, and mm -hmm. how political they were, and, and a lot of those were your people, you know, of African descent. And I I did some oral histories uh, with the Centro at one point, and a lot of those people, uh, those early uh, pioneers who were part and who were members of the organizations that Jesus Colon was working in were, um, you know, or like had African descent, you know, and, and uh, you know, it, it was just fascinating it, well, it, how cultured and mm -hmm. how smart, how educated this African population, uh, uh, this African Puerto Rican African uh, community was in Puerto Rico, and then they they're the first here, and they live in Harlem, and you know, and and we have so much. We, there's their history is so invisible, it's so damn invisible, you know. And uh, so when you're doing Jesus Colon, mm -hmm. <laughs> that might be a focus, you know. Well, you know, uh, I, I uh, the first cooperative that was created in Puerto Rico was a black person who created it. The first attempt at creating a union in Puerto Rico it was uh, a black person who also created it. It was artesanos. And they were the most advanced in, in, at the end of the 1800s because they were the most advanced because they were the artesanos. They were the, the people that did things. Uh, so, so yes, that, and it was in the coast. <clears throat> where, the, where where most of the artesanos were found mm -hmm. so yeah I think that that uh, that the that the Puerto Ricans of black descent uh, were very advanced in this in that sense that, that they were artesanos uh, and they they started organizing themselves first the first influences were more like anarchist mm -hmm. right Ty type of readings that they would they, that they would do because they would do the readings they would read uh, fiction and they would read political uh, books mm -hmm. to the to the for, for example for the palilleros right the ones that roll mm -hmm. the tobacco they would have readers uh, but the artesanos in Puerto Rico were very advanced you know they, you could say they were the, really the most advanced group in terms of uh, of the whole population because the rest of the population was very poor oh, and the other and the other section of the population was uh, the landowners. You know, back then, so so yeah, they were very 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 advanced. If you read the La Memoria de Bernardo Vega, for example, it's amazing. You know the, the things that he says in there. Yeah. The Pura Belfre Belfre identify as an Afro Boricua? No, she didn't. <laughs> This was a very sticky issue for me to deal with in the biography because this topic comes up all the time. Look, look at our modernist quartet. Look at our, our first half of the 20th century's most important intellectuals. Almost all of them are of obvious sub-Saharan African descent. Um, but the language, the discourse of, of the African diaspora, of the shared experience of being um, uh, dispersed historically because of the slave trade, of the shared experience uh, um, of uh, injustice, social injustice in the United States, um, of the shared experience of, of racial discrimination. That's a recent invention. That's a recent invention. She was she married an African American man, and and, and in her letter she there was some discussion that they had. She was anxious about moving from East Harlem into Harlem, Harlem, where he wanted to live, because she said, you know, you've lived abroad, and you know this is going to take some cultural adjustment on my part, right? So she, while she recognized that um, that there was a there was a sort of universality to the experience of childhood, and she talks about that all the time. And, and it, she still considered herself Boricua culturally. She had a cultural identity. 
she wasn't interested in the discourses of racial identity. When, when, when she's writing to her husband right before they get married, she does use the language of racial uplift, which is part of the uh, black discourse, African-American discourse in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And uh, she um, collaborated with and socialized with uh, a lot of people who we might call like the African-American aristocracy of New England. She was out there on Martha's Vineyard. She summered in Martha's Vineyard. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but she did not, she did not develop a language of that kind of language to, to, to talk about herself. And it shouldn't surprise us. I, mean, I, I just taught Phoebe Thomas's Down These Mean Streets. And, you know, sadly, it was the same week we started reading it in one of my classes that he passed away. He's having a hard time. And that book is published in 1967, trying to articulate an identity that's Boricua culturally, an African-American, racially. That whole novel is about that identity crisis, which he never resolves in that novel. So, and Colon, you know, I could go on and on and on. I'm going to stop because there were a lot of other, a lot of, but it's, it, this is why we need more graduate students writing dissertations on these topics. Isn't, isn't that what we go through? I, I think we go through that every, uh, I experienced that maybe a couple, maybe twice already with the census when they ask you, mm. you're Puerto Rican, you know, Hispanic, Puerto Rican, blah, blah, blah. I still don't know how to answer race because of what you're just saying. Mm. I always identified myself as Puerto Rican, but what do you mean by color? So that's like a new thing when I hear about... Well, being um, Puerto Rican is a nationality. But in the census, it asks you, there's, there's a... And being Latino is an ethnicity. Yeah, but it's not, but they're asking you your color. I'm telling you, because I used to work mm. for the census as well. And I was well, like, how do you answer that? Well, you'd be surprised. In Puerto Rico, so, in Puerto Rico, last census, uh, over 90% are white. Oh, white yeah. so. That was a penepe. <laughs> that was a penepe. <laughs> they are white. They did that on purpose. <laughs> no, no, no. Let's see this. But, Mejorar la raza. Mejorar la raza. You know, and your grandmother don't talk about it. Well, but I also want to add that um, Arturo Schomburg, who's who's one of the, the few um, early 20th century Boricua cultural intellectuals and activist, a radical in his own right, he was a biblio radical. Um, a bibliophile and an archi arch archival researcher. Uh, you, you know who he is. Yeah. Um, it, one of the things I discovered when I was doing research about him was that there was some resistance within the African American literary established establishment, within the African American cultural intellectual groups uh, uh, that he experienced when, when he was appointed or he was about to be appointed a position at what's now called the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, there was an uproar. Uh, they wanted an African American to, to get that position. And uh, it was covered in a local paper in, in which Du Bois, W.E.B. Du, du Bois himself, was making the argument against hiring Schomburg to to work in his own collection, you know. So we, we, history is complicated, and cultural cultural politics in New York City is super super complicated. 
So, with, you know, the more we study this and the more research and primary documents that we find to flesh out what really happened in our communities, the better. Because uh, it's, not, it's, not it's not just necessarily on, uh, a, a, a sense of, of not being proud of, of, of blackness that blocks certain Boricua figures in our history from being active in that arena. It's also resistance that has come uh, from African Americans to including uh, Boricuas in the, in the flock. Uh, Petey Thomas writes about this as well. I mean, it's a very interesting issue, but... Pedro had a question. Yeah, just two comments that um, is that, that is, it's common for Jesus Colón and for many black Puerto Ricans or African defendants, they identified themselves as Puerto Ricans. And that was not that they were denying their African ancestry. They were proud that they were Puerto Ricans. And so sometimes to abide the terminology of a Puerto Rican for them, it was, it was never part of the reality. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that I found as a common thread, uh, when we look at the Fran Bonilla, we look at Antonio Mantoja, and even Pura Ventres, they were proactive in terms of the culture. They were not waiting for the establishment mm -hmm. to teach Puerto Rican things. They challenged them, mm -hmm. and they, that's what they are pioneers. And, and so it's our challenge to look for our culture, to teach our children our culture, and come to the places that have built up a, a treasure of information. Because you come to the archives, and there are many, many lives. And then what you have to do is build bridges with other communities that look for different professionals in different fields, filmmakers or whatever, that use those resources and produce different products that give you more tools to, to be proud and to show and to take you know, your culture ahead. In the back or something. She had over a thousand libraries under her auspices. And prior to doing that, she was supervisor of libraries in District 16. And prior to doing that, she was the librarian who named her the mobile library unit, oh. the Cora Velpre oh. Caravan. Oh. And as her daughter, who also was very interested in artist and an educator and a writer. I was interested in so many of the wonderful things that my mother did. She was a storyteller, librarian. And I, I knew that she recognized that in District 16, the student population consisted of primarily African American students and Latino, primarily Puerto Rican students. And my mother would often say, that the children's scores are low because they have this image issue and they need to see their he heroes. They need to see heroes that look like them. Mm -hmm. They need to see heroes that come from their cultural background. So she named one of the libraries the John Stetso Library. This is a young mm -hmm. African American uh, children's uh, uh, a book writer. And she named the caravan after uh, uh, poor Velcro. And my mother would have events in District 16 and invite her to come. There was the naming ceremony and all sorts of storytelling events. And she would call on the best, right, the best uh, chauffeur that she knew. <laughs> she would send the chauffeur to Harlem to pick her up. And that's what I did. I would go and I would pick her up from her home in Harlem and I would drive her to District 16 in Brooklyn. And I was enriched every time. 
there were times that my mother sent me to pick up people and it was a chore. When I picked up Cora Velpre, it was, I was always eager to do it because I was always enriched by her stories, her grace. She was a lovely, lovely person and she just drew me in with all of her, her, uh, our words of wisdom. At any event, I thought I would share that with all of you. Thank you. And I had the honor of knowing her. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Come on. Okay. Yeah, well, th thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, and keep supporting the Centro. <laughs> now, are, are the CDs out there, the film? Yeah. Oh, you may want to talk about that. Oh. Uh, yeah, the, 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 <laughs> videos, the videos are, the DVDs are for sale in, in the table up front when you, when, you get, when you go out. Well, I know online you can get a few of the media. Uh, not anymore. No, now it's password <laughs> protected. I was asked to, uh, they asked me to take it down. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I screened it for yeah. my class before the password <laughs> went up. <out>. Yeah. <laughs> you know how I found out about it? Yeah, I've been, I, I've been on the stuff. They have one that's And they had the, yeah, they had one over here. Yeah.